we're going to do something new now. Uh, based on what we were talking about um, with Jason and the database and all of that, we're going to start to look at a, a bit of a more powerful implementation of a database so that we can add this to our, our app. Let me show you a very basic example of it that will uh, eventually be integrated into our project so that it'll look nice. I'm going to show it to you in a way first that looks very basic and I personally like to kind of work on code just to focus on the code first and then add it up together so that it looks nice. So imagine this is in a screen in our CBDB app. We're going to have fields that are going to be uh, that are going to be asked. Uh, the title of the, of the comic, its number, the year, publisher, and a comment. And then eventually we'll add barcode scanner and picture archive and all of that. But we're going to ask for some things that are required and some things that are optional. I've already saved one item in the database. Again, imagine with jQuery Mobile this will look nice with nice pop-ups and design and all of that. So I've saved one comic so far. So I'm going to save another one. So I go in, The Amazing Spider-Man, number 2, 1963, and this time I won't put a publisher or a comment, I'll just click Save. So now that added a new item to the database, it automatically shows up. I can then click the a little comment icon to display the information of that particular one, what I wrote there. Click on the other one. I didn't. I never wrote, wrote its publisher, its comment. We're going to be able to edit that to update it, and then we're going to be able to delete one. Let's say I don't need number two anymore, so I can click delete. It'll pop up. Are you sure you want to delete it? Click OK, uh, and then it'll it'll delete it. So this is what we're going to do together. First, we're going to focus on basic HTML, basic JavaScript. Well, we are going to use jQuery. Uh, let's not torture ourselves with basic mm -hmm. JavaScript, so we'll use jQuery and HTML. And we're going to work on this first, and then we're going to integrate this into our CBDB project. So I don't want to deal with loading up Visual Studio and letting it compile and all of the overhead of a big old editor. We're going to use plain old Notepad. We're going to, or Notepad++. We're going to write this code. Once it works, then we'll add it to our project. But all of this works very similar to what we've talked about with JSON, but more complex. This is a database. And it's uh, better than what we saw a moment ago with JSON because this can create a database that can exist solely in the device, or better yet, on a server. Why would we want our data or database on a server as opposed to a device? Backup. We wrote our stuff in our uh, app here. I drop it in the lake. I lose everything. If our data is also saved to a server, there's a backup. Also for migration. Let's say I have this phone that I got a year ago. and It's so passe now. It's a whole year old. I want the next version. So I buy the new version. I install the app. I want the data to come from the old device to the new device. That happens via a server. Your data gets saved in the cloud on the internet and the data comes to the new device. We're going to start off in the simpler way about having the data being saved to the device. Then we'll talk about on a server and all of that. Spoiler alert, it's not free to put it then on a server. That's where these companies make their money. They're going to give you all this free stuff. But then to put it on a real server, Amazon Web Server, Microsoft Server, Google Server, GoDaddy Server, those are not free. Maybe you get like a free month or a free year, but then after that, you have to pay for your data on a server. But we'll get to that later. I'm just going to do the offline version. So let's say I'm saving here Donald Duck number 321 from 1998 from Disney Comics. Okay, right, comment. Very valuable. Save that. That's going to get saved to the database. Well, I can obviously display as much as I want. Here I only want to focus on the title, if I spell it properly. Uh, I want to focus on the title and the number, and then if I need to see that other info, and imagine this will not appear 
until you click that button in a nice little pop-up. For it to display the name, number, edit ability, and delete ability. That'll come with jQuery Mobile. So the way we're going to get started is I have uh, a starting folder in the network folder. If you go to the network folder, you're going to see a folder there called Pouch DB Intro. Copy that folder. That's going to be our starting folder. Copy the whole folder to your flash drive. I'm going to copy it to my flash drive and I'm going to put today's date. What's the name of the file? PouchDB Intro. What's in the folder are two JavaScript libraries, two JavaScript files jQuery and something called PouchDB. So we're going to use jQuery. Uh, plain old JavaScript works, but we've seen how verbose it is. Document.getElementById replaced by dollar symbol. Uh, things like dot inner HTML equals replaced by dot HTML. So jQuery again, write less, do more. jQuery also gives us the ability to do animation. Did you, did you notice that a moment ago that the comic book stuff faded in? when I um, when I actually added something. Let me add another one. Uh, I don't know. We'll erase that later. Save. Notice how that faded, fades in with a little bit of an animation. If I click there, it fades in. Something subtle like that. So jQuery also lets us do um, also lets us do um, animation. So I'm giving you in that folder jQuery library, which you can download from jQuery.com. And then I'm also giving you this other file, PouchDB. <coughs> we never need to open these files. These files are libraries. Pouch is 148 kilobytes. It's hundreds, it's thousands of lines of code that you never need to look into, you never need to mess with. You just need to know how does Pouch work. You just need to know how does jQuery work. We can learn, of course, how jQuery works at jQuery.com and throughout the class. Let's go look at the accompanying website for PouchDB, found at PouchDB.com. Let's go to PouchDB.com, Pouch Database, PouchDB.com. The database that syncs, synchronizes. PouchDB is an open-source JavaScript database inspired by Apache CouchDB that is designed to run well within the browser. PouchDB was created to help web developers build apps that work well offline and online. It enables apps to store data locally while offline and then synchronize with a CouchDB incompatible servers when the app is back online, keeping the user's data in sync no matter where they next log in. So that JSON file, that was a database there was a very, very, very simple database. That file had the data of our project. We want that to have the ability to store more data and to also retrieve it from multiple devices. So we need something more powerful, such as PouchDB. PouchDB is a way to store data. There is going to be various pouch commands. All of this is JavaScript. There's going to be a command to create a new instance of a PouchDB database. We're going to create a variable, the name of our database, anything we want, db for example. We're then going to instantiate a new instance of PouchDB object with some name. We'll do this for real in a moment. Then we can put something into the database. We've got the database object, which has a bunch of methods, which are all defined on this website. Dot put, dot changes, dot get, dot delete, all of these commands. So we're going to put data into the database in JSON format. Does that look familiar? Curly braces? 
uh, key quotations. and value pair. No quotations, good point. It should use quotations, and I emailed them about it, and they haven't updated it, even though they said, yes, you're right. But they haven't updated it yet. So yes, we're going to use quotes, colon, quotes, comma, quotes, called JSON formatted data. This is putting into the database something with an ID of an email address, comma, with a name of a person, comma, and the age. That's exactly what we looked at with the networks. Then we have the method of changes. In the event of a change to the database, we had something dot on click. We have something dot on double click. Now we're going to have something dot on changes. When the database changes, do something like display in the console that there have been ch -ch 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 changes. And then even cooler, we've got a database on our device. Let's replicate it to our server. And then our data gets copied to the cloud. And then we have replicate from a server. Pull the data off of the server back to our device to synchronize. This is what PouchDB will do. It will let us create a database, save stuff to a database, edit the database, delete the database, copy the database, all that stuff. For free, of course. All the stuff I show you in class is free. What other databases have you heard of? Anyone heard of other databases? Mongo. Uh, what's that? Database, uh, how many fields we can... Uh, Let's answer my first question first. What other databases have we have we heard of? NoSQL style, um, MySQL, Fox Pro, Oracle. There's lots of databases out there. This is just another. This is just another kind of database. How much data can we save? The documentation will tell us here, but the short answer is a lot. We can store a lot of data. We'll look it up exactly how much in a moment, but lots of fields, as many as you want, basically. And you can create multiple databases. You can create a database with like 10,000 fields, and then create a new one with 10,000 more. So you have, you do have a limit to how much you can save in one database, but you can create 20 databases. And you can refer to them how, whenever you need, and so there's sort of no limit every time you create a new database but the database itself has a limit. Yeah? Is it the same as uh, access? I mean, this database can be connected to each other? Very good point. This database is not like a traditional relational database. It is a flat database. It is a uh, NoSQL style database, meaning that this this database is not actually related to another database. DB1 is not related to DB2 like in Access where you would have a, a table of names and a table of IDs and they're related. We don't have that kind of relationship, but, but it, it still works the same. We'll see how once we do it. But it's not a relational database. It's a NoSQL style database, which is becoming more and more popular. Yes? Um, can we search on this database as well? Yes. We'll be able to search in the database, pull out specific data, pull out all the data, pull out a sequence of data. It is searchable. But what's the prefer of this database I mean, compared to the others? Well, the thing about any database is that they're all, they're all great and they're all terrible. They're all good answer, they're all wrong answer. It depends what you're trying to do. The reason I'm showing this one is because I, I don't have a server for us to install Access, or I don't have a server for you to install you know, MySQL and PHP. I don't want you to pay for that for a real server. So we're using a database that for our purposes doesn't need a server at the moment. And later on, if we do want to use a real server, we can and we'll be able to copy or replicate our data to a real server. So all the databases work, and all of them do the same thing, basically. They all have their own syntax, their own positives and negatives. So it's just a matter of choosing one, learning how it works, and then using it for our purpose. 
Uh, this goes on to tell you it's cross-browser, it's lightweight, easy to learn, open source. One of, the, one of my favorite things, because Oracle, for example, is a great, popular, powerful database. It's not open source. It's expensive. It runs on special uh, servers and all of that. This can run on open source servers, and it's all free. It's constantly being developed because it's open source. Version 6.3.4 just came out. I just saw 6.3 a few days ago. Now the new one is out. A team of people as most open source is behind this. Regular old people that might have a day job that are working on something to create a project for everyone, rather than a big company that controls it. There's pros and cons of open source as always. Let's go look at the guides screen. Click guides at the top. What is Pouch? It tells you that it's a variation of CouchDB. What is CouchDB? You go off there and go read Couch if you want. What is CouchDB? What's the difference? Whatever. So basically using common web technologies to create a database with not a lot of setup. This lets you synchronize. So setting it up. Installing, um, reading the data, etc. So there's setup as always, but let's say I jump down to the working with the database. So working with the database. To create a local database, simply call a new pouch and give it a name. New instance. So here's a database called kittens. It's going to be all about kittens. So Okay, if I want to connect to a version on a server, you need the server set up, and then you can connect to your version on the server. We can check info about the database, and it'll give it to us back in JSON format. How many documents are in the database? Zero. How many updates? Zero. What's the name of the database? Now you will see it's in double quotes as we've seen before. Uh, the remote one has other information also, like what's the version of the operating system and the size of the data and all of that. So all of that is stuff we can get. Data.kittens.dbname. Data.kittens.disk size, 79. Debugging using the, uh, the web browser. We're going to use a, the screen in the web browser um, to show us what's in the database. We don't need anything special. The developer's console will also tell us that information. It'll let us read from the database. So debugging, deleting, etc. So working with documents. So a document. PouchDB is a NoSQL database, meaning that you store unstructured documents rather than explicitly specifying a schema with rows and tables. And a document is what we've seen before. Some key, colon, some value, comma, etc. Some key with more complex data, sequential data. So here's a particular unique identifier, mittens. The name of that cat is mittens. Its occupation is it's a kitten. Its age is three. Its hobbies are playing with balls of yarn, chasing laser pointers, looking very cute. So data, all of that is storing one document of one kitten, one user. So we might have another kitten with its own fields, but all of this is a document, everything in the curly braces. In other databases like Oracle and such, you have the ideas of tables and rows and such. A PouchDB NoSQL database doesn't exactly have tables. You can kind of think about it as your whole file is a table. And inside of a traditional database, a row is a document, and a document is all of this. A column is a field, so the column of ID. You've got a column, all the IDs below it are the, uh, are the fields, the field of ID primary key. There is one field that is required in a PouchDB document. 
underscore ID. Besides that, you can make up fields named anything. But you have to have an underscore ID to separate this document from another document. There is only one user called Mittens in this database. I'd have to make a new one called Mittens2. Because the first Mittens has its own data, which cannot conflict with another Mittens, so Mittens2. An index in a traditional database is a view in Pouch. Here's a variation of what we saw previously. We saw db.put, and the JSON data was in the parentheses. A smarter way is putting your data in a variable and then just passing the variable in. It's the same idea that we've got the curly braces. But this is the way we're going to do it. We're going to create variables, the name of some variable, doesn't matter, comic, equal to a JSON object full of the information we're asking for. ID of comic name. Issue number, an issue number. Comment, a comment. And all of that information will be asked of the user. All right? we're going to ask the title, the name, and all of that, and that's going to save. That's going to be wrapped into a JSON object, put into the database, and then we get it from the database to display it on screen and search it and process it. Mm, there's get. Let's get a document based on the ID field. So that ID has to be unique. Nothing else in the database can have that ID. We're going to get the record. We're going to get the document, mittens. Then we'll run a function and just console output. It'll just spit back out what was in the document with a new field, underscore rev, revisions. We're going to want to update the data. I misspelled something. So, understanding revs, there's going to be a field, another reserved field, rev, with some random string of numbers that identifies the, ver the first version of the data. If you make a change, it will be 2-something. Another change, 3-something. Unlimited changes. But this will keep track, then, of the different changes of your data, also. And then how to update the data. We'll, we'll do all of this together. But this is the documentation now that uh, you've got something. Uh, you've got some new uh, reading to do. Uh, when you have a, a moment, you know, uh, crack a bottle of wine, go by the fireplace, read the PouchDB manual. Uh, so of course we don't need to know every single thing about how this works. We need to know en enough about it about for it to do what we want to create a, an app that saves information about a comic book collection or any inventory system and store it in the database and retrieve it and edit it and all of that stuff. So that's how we're going to focus here with a clean HTML document instead of our Visual Studio project because we have to wait for that to load, we have to compile it, we have to wrestle with all of that. Let's just do this in a simple plain HTML file. Once it works, we'll then drop it into our, our Visual Studio project. The API screen is the, is the even nerdier screen about how this all works. Uh, all of the details and, uh, you know, possible parameters and everything. So we saw how to create a database. Technically, you can also pass options and what are the options and all of that. So this is a longer document with examples, deleting the database. And then learn. There's a, a few nice tutorials here that you might want to go through if you're interested, if you find that pouch works for your projects. You go through some more tutorials to further see how it works, understand what it's about. And somewhere here, I believe it's where it tells you fac, what the sizes are, how much data can pouch store. So in different browsers, Firefox, for example, will store 50 megabytes. 
This is just text. 50 megabytes of text is a lot. It's not going to store the picture in the database, just like, uh, just like we weren't storing um, the networks folder, the networks file, it was not actually storing the picture in here. It's just storing a reference to the picture. So 50 megabytes, that's only going to be five pictures. No, it's going to be 5,000 pictures because it's going to be a reference to the picture in the folder or the server. If we were uh, in Chrome, is uh, determine the amount of storage available on the user's hard drive. So we can use up that person's terabyte on their, on their hard drive. Opera, Safari, iOS. Okay, on an, I, on an iPhone, it shows here how much. 50 megabytes. On an Android, uh, works the same as Chrome, so it'll eat up all the person's memory if, if we let it. Or on Android, older versions of Android, 200 megs. It's a lot of data. And uh, again, we can create more than one database. This one database maxes out to 50. Just create another database called DB2. You have another 50 megs. And you can retrieve and use that data as you wish. So that's the technical aspect. In the folder that I gave you, I already downloaded the file. I put jQuery in there. We're going to set up a basic HTML file to be able to use jQuery and Pouch and start to set up a project that will ask for these fields and start to save them into the database. And that's, that's going to be our starting point. We're going to add more to it, and that's going to be easy, just like 200 lines of code. And uh, now we'll get more complex. So in your project folder, you've got jQuery and Pouch. Let's go to Notepad++ and create a new file. And let's save it. Create a new file and save it into your folder, your pouch intro folder. Save it as HTML and we can call it uh, pouch today's date 2017-08-01. We're going to create the same basic 10 lines as usual, doc type, body, HTML, head, quick 10 lines of HTML code, and we're going to connect the JavaScript libraries. So make sure this file is saved in the pouchdb folder that you copied. We'll get our practice again here on the basic HTML project. Meta tag so that we are uh, so that the browsers can read our language title call it pouch db practice That's all we need for the moment. So let's uh, put together this basic HTML file and then we'll proceed. the end of body, we're going to connect to the jQuery and the pouch libraries. So script, source, attribute, the name of your jQuery file. I'm just going to copy 
copy it from the folder so I don't mistype it. I want to load jQuery first. It's often the first library we load. It's often the foundation of so many other libraries and projects. It's just a JavaScript file full of a bunch of jet definitions, so we can write less JavaScript code to accomplish more. And then we need a script reference to the pouch file. Okay, and you can copy the file name to save your typing. Don't forget the .js. When you copy a file, often it doesn't copy the extension. Both of these are minified. .min. So even if you did open them in Notepad, they would look really compact. A lot of uh, it's very unreadable because it's been compressed. <coughs> these files have been compressed for faster processing by the by the device, not for readability by the programmer. The visual aspect of the project is also just about 20 lines, nothing, uh, nothing that complex. The complexity is in the JavaScript. So let's back up to the body. I'm going to create a form. Collect data from the user about the comic. We need, a, we need an ID on this form so that we can style it, but maybe more importantly, so that we can reference it in the JavaScript. We'll call this form save comic. In the example, I showed you that there's going to be two required fields and a few optional fields. So we can separate the required ones from the not required ones visually by using a field set. So anything, anytime we need to collect data, or most times that we need to collect data from the user, we have a form these input boxes. And we're going to have a field set for our first chunk of required information. We have a legend. This legend will be text that is visible on screen. So obviously here we fill in Just kidding. Here we fill in, um, we're going to have it say required. There's going to be an area of required content. I then want to create an area for optional content. So a quick way to do this, copy this chunk, paste it right afterward. I need another field set, another legend, which will then be optional. I'm going to ask for a few fields that are required and a set of fields that are optional. Separate, 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 separate um, the required fields. optional fields. This is this itself that we're doing here is optional. This just creates that little box, those little boxes around the example project. Let me pull 
pull that up very quickly. The example project, right? Those those boxes. It's just kind of a visual thing. We're gonna have a box around required, a box around optional. Field set. That's what those do. That's what those do. And the text that appears, the text optional, the text required, is the legend. This is a very unique pair of tags. They, they really only work together. We, we basically need them both. Field set is going to create the box, yeah, and legend <laughs> is going to create the text. But if you have them separate, they don't really do anything. You want them both. Text attached to the box on screen. All of that can be styled, of course, colors and sizes and placement and all of that through CSS. But uh, very basically, visually, that's what those look like. We're going to ask for a title of the comic and an issue number of the comic. So we need to display the word title and the word number and then a box to accept the title and the number. So after legend, we're going to have a label, and we're going to have an input. Label is going to be the visual text. Input is going to be the box. Notice this does not have a pair. This is another few. This is another of the few examples of tags of HTML that do not have a pair. Label is text visible. Is text on screen? Actually, we should. Uh, and then we should have a label is text on screen, and then uh, input is the input box. So we're asking for a title. And I, put a sp I, I didn't put a space here a moment ago, and then I did put a space. You can either put the space here or put the space here. We need some sort of space to separate the word title from the box. You can either add the space in the label or outside the label. If you don't put the space, the text and the box will be right next to each other. So I'm just adding a space there. So the word title is what's going to be visible. Input needs a bunch of attributes. When we were setting up, remember, our login system, we had these input fields asking for a password and all of that. Uh, type equal, quotes. What type of input, what type of data am I, am I accepting? Here, simply text text data. Placeholder. Anything we want. Mickey Mouse. The comic Mickey Mouse. A little preview text that appears to show people what they could type. At the end of that line, break. So then we can ask for a second thing. A label. An input. We're asking for the, the title of the comic or the name of the comic. For example, Mickey Mouse number 12. So we're going to ask for 
number or issue number. The input this time is of type number. I only want to accept numbers here. I don't want a person to type, you know, X, Y, Z. Mickey Mouse number X, Y, Z. That doesn't exist. I want numbers. Roman numerals? Yeah. Well, when we're talking about numbers, we're usually dealing with real numbers, so whole numbers. Although sometimes there are numbers that are, comics that are numbered one half and negative one and zero, if people want to get creative. But I, I, I don't think I've heard really that they use Roman numerals for numbers. No placeholder here is. Well, I guess we can add one just to also show people. It's going to say not necessary, but I guess we'll add it. So let's say, you know, 12. We're going to write a number here. Number should be obvious, but you know, we can't make this stuff foolproof. There's so many ingenious fools. So we should be obvious. If you run it, it doesn't work yet, of course, but we have an input field for the name of the comic and the number of the comic. I'm going to run this in uh, Chrome. Firefox, uh, either or, I guess it, it won't matter. Um, yeah, so Firefox or Chrome should give you the same result. You'll be able to type letters there. If you try to type letters here, it won't let you. Only numbers. Now these are required. Didn't we set up a way when we made our login system for the fields to be required? Here's a new attribute, or the return of an attribute. Input type text required. I want both the number and the name to be required. Yes? Uh, oh, let, let me let me check that. Oh, okay. Well, there's Firefox meaning lenient again. <laughs> now, I typed uh, numbers, but now because of required, now it's showing me that's a problem. See that when I click it, I want to put a letter, but it's saying there's a problem there. So eventually, anyway, remember, we're going to put this to devices. So um, from the testing, the devices should obey number only. So we're not adjusting the name, right? Just the default, or we're putting the number? Yeah, it's also there in Chrome. Uh, this will increment numbers. So, you know, if I want to add a certain number, I can increment the numbers. Well, if you've got it maximized like that, it's not going to be responsive. <laughs> Say that again. Device, oh, it's not responsive because we never wrote that meta tag. Remember, we have the meta tag viewport equals device width and so forth. All right, so we wrote this, but before we move on, um, technically this label is not associated with this input, and this label is not associated with that input. Anyone remember how we associate them? IDs and one more thing. Please. Not quite field, but on those lines, remember we have label four. Data role would only work when we're dealing with jQuery mobile. We don't have jQuery mobile yet. We have label four. This label is going to be used for this name and ID. So we need the fields, the the for attribute, 
uh, we'll call this in title. This is an input of title. And then and then for the input, we need name equals in title and ID equals in title. The name is what associates the label with the input, but the ID is what we need for JavaScript, so that's why those are the same. Do the same thing for the next one. In number, in number for the label, four, and then in number for the name and for the ID, in number <coughs> name equals in number ID equals in number now here optionally I'm tabbing these over just so that they line up. This, of course, doesn't matter. And I want to line them up there, maybe because I like how they look like. Sometimes it looks weird. Yeah, that lines up nicely there, but then there's this empty space. Optional. Just for aesthetics in your code. Now we've got input fields, labels associated with those input fields, and IDs so that we can um, read them via the JavaScript. We're going to set up something very similar for the other fields, which are going to be year, which is going to be type of number, publisher, type of text, and comment, which will actually be a little bit different. We haven't seen this one yet. This one can let you write multiple lines of comments, whereas these other ones are a single line that just goes on and on. So when we get to comment, it'll be a little different. But that's going to be now in the optional field set. We need a label again, an input again, do the third one in a moment because it's a little different. So we're also asking for a year. Type text, or type number. A year is a number. We're asking for uh, publisher. Type of text. If we select text, it can do text or numbers. Usually when we set number, it can only be number. So I'm talking about text and numbers, not or numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I said. So if you put text, it can be a text and or a number. And or. Yes. So then uh, here we need to fill in name and for, we don't need required because these will not be required. So I'll start off with, with for, do in year, name, in year, ID, in year. I'll add a placeholder. Remember, I like to keep ID as the very last item or class, and name often as one of the last ones. It really wouldn't matter what order you put it. 
I could put placeholder after ID, but I personally like ID at the very end. Placeholder. The publisher is Disney. The publisher is Disney, but the year is like 1948 or something. Number 12 is really old and valuable. Then the publisher will be Disney. Four in publisher name in publisher. So this is obviously a little repetitive, but logically I like it. I like that it has this regularity to it. Publisher Disney. I uh, forgot to do a break there. It may look weird. So I've got your first input for year. Break. Break that one because we then will have comment. Comment will be a little bit different. It's not a type, it's not an input type of text. It's a little different. final one is comment. It starts off also as having a label. Comment. But this time it's a text area. And this one's further weird because it's got an opening and closing text area. So forms are like so old from like HTML 1.2, <coughs> like from 1990. The but back then, no one had the good idea to why not we why don't we just call it input type equals text area? Nope, it's text area. Open close tags. And it's one of the special ones. Input type number. Input type button. Input type text. Input type phone number. Text area. Label will be in comment. And in the first opening tag of text area, we add the attributes, of course. So name equals in comment, and ID equals in comment. And then a placeholder. We can add a placeholder to this as well. First appearance of uh, Huey. First appearance of Huey and Dewey, but not Louie. Yes. Is there any limitation of the text? I mean, 40 words and 50 words as much as it works? As much as you want. It will it will fit as much as you want here. Uh, you can set it to how many lines to display at once, but it's still no limit. You can display how many columns, but it's still no limit of how much they can type. But how it can show all this data in a, in a table? In the example here, the the table the data is that data is not going to be shown right away. We're only going to show the name and the number of the comic. Then, when they click a button on another screen, it will show it in a bigger screen, so you can see, so you can read it better. No, and that and that's a problem. That's a hard thing to design because we don't know how much data could be input, we could limit it if we want. We could say only 20 characters, and that way we know that our design should look a certain way. But some people might want to write more, and 20 is not enough. 
All right, so here's our document so far. Title, number, year publisher comment. All of this is inside of a form. Bunch of labels and inputs. We need then, um, we want to start over. I was about to write a comic, but I, I want to start over. We need a reset button, and then we need a submit button. A button that says, okay, let's save this. So at the end of our line here of text area, let's add a break so that on the next line we can add some of these other buttons. We've got input without a label of type equals reset. Value is the text that displays on screen so we don't need a label because the value already is visible text. Space another input of type submit and the value of the button will be save. So now if you save it and run it, the reset button should work. You fill something in, press reset, it cancels it. Submit button doesn't work yet. Of course, that'll be a bunch of JavaScript. And we should um, we should see that the uh, this HTML barely twenty five lines. That's all we really need for the HTML. Next will come like two hundred lines of JavaScript we have to capture that data, process it, store it, then retrieve it and re-show re it, delete it, update it. That's going to be the hard part. This is the easy part, uh, collecting the data. We'll um, take our next break now to make sure we're up to this point, and then uh, when we come back, we'll we'll actually have it do something to start to capture this data.